What's going on? So good to see you at Church Online. My name's Greg. And I'm Nat. And we are part of the team here at Saint. Nat, how's your week been? My week's been good. I've been spending a lot of time at the dog park. Oh, nice. Great community there, I'm not gonna lie. Love it. That's yeah. a pretty nice jacket that you've got. <laughs> oh, thanks. Looks very familiar. Are you trying to say it's yours? Because it's not. I'm not saying it's not, but <laughs> I'm saying I could look good in it. Mm. But um, oh. what's going on in this service? This week we have a couple of songs of worship, we have Saint News, and then we're hearing a word from last year's Renaissance from EJ Nokore, and it's gonna be great. Sick, so excited. How about I pray and we get into it? Sounds good. Thank you, God, for all you're doing in this service. Thank you for the word that we're about to hear. Thank you for the time of worship. I pray that it blesses each person watching online. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Sometimes there's an ocean that lies in between But I'll keep on traveling the path where you've been Till I'm right where you want me, that's where I will be Tried so hard to see it. 
took me so long to believe it That you choose someone like me To carry your victory Perfection could never end it You give what we don't deserve it You take the broken thing You are my champion. For you are my champion. Giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you've won, I am. I am who you say I am. For you crown me with confidence. I am seated in the heavens.
Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this week, Lord. I pray that you just be, go with us this week. I pray for this nation, that you be with our political leaders. And I pray that you just provide your peace in any situation that we may be going through. I pray that you'd walk with us. And we just thank you for everything that you're going to do in and through our lives, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to hear about everything going on in the life of Saint with our Saint News Summer Special with Al. Enjoy. Welcome to the Saint News Summer Special. My name's Al, I lead the church, and it is a real honor to have you here if you're visiting for the first time over these summer weeks. Our vision as a church is real simple, to bring hope to the people of this incredible city. We are one church that meets across multiple locations in Hackney, Homerton, West Ham, Shoreditch, Leighton, and of course, online. And if you're watching us online, huge welcome. We have 11 gathering services each Sunday with kids groups, youth work, loads of hangouts, and time to get to know people. So wherever you're coming from today, wherever you're watching us, there is something in this community where you are gonna come alive find your purpose and make great friends. There's lots to look forward to in the weeks ahead and perhaps you've walked in the church the very first time today, in which case, can I get you to fill in one of these join-in cards? It's a chance for us to connect with you. We'll send you an email, follow up and invite you to a bunch of stuff. And also, like, if you're like new to church, please don't wait for someone to come and find you. Make yourself known, go find one of the hosting team, say hello. We would just love to meet with you, get to know you, catch up and hear your story. And if you're watching online as well, you can go, of course, to saint.church slash join in and do all the details there. Another quick thing to let you know about, if you're brand new to church, maybe exploring faith for the first time, we would love to invite you on Alpha. Alpha is an incredible way to explore life's big questions in a safe, free, fun environment, where over a period of weeks, you get to go on a journey through some of the big questions of life. And the next Alpha kicks off in the autumn, and we would love to invite you to be there. And maybe you've got friends, maybe you've done Alpha, and maybe there's two or three people you might want to come with. It's going to be so much fun. It has a huge impact on people's lives. 5th of October is the launch date. It's happening across all our locations. So wherever you're watching this, you will be able to connect with Alpha, bring friends along. It's going to be so much fun. Final thing to let you know about today is Renaissance is only three months away. It's going to be so much fun. We're gathering again creative leaders from across London and around the world to join us for two days of wonder. Get you excited, have a look at this. You can find out all the details at saint.church slash renaissance. Make sure you get a ticket before they go. And for now, that's all we've got time for. I hope you're doing really well. Thanks for listening and see you very soon. So we have a bunch of cool stuff happening here at Saint that Al mentioned. And one thing I'm super excited for is Alpha that is starting soon. So Nat, tell me a bit about Alpha. We're so pumped about Alpha. It starts Wednesday, October the 5th. And we just wanted to encourage you guys to think of someone that's in your heart or on your mind um, that maybe you could invite, that maybe has questions or could just be fun to bring along. So keep that in mind and we'll see you there. And are you excited about Renaissance coming up? I'm so excited about Renaissance. We have some of the best speakers coming in. We are gonna be worshiping all together as one big happy church. And there's a bunch of labs as well. So it's kind of design your own journey through Renaissance. Wow. So I'm super excited. And speaking of Renaissance, we have someone speaking from last Renaissance. Yes, so we're gonna have a look at last year and we're gonna hear from EJ, who's bringing a nice little talk for us. Fun fact about EJ, he is a senior director at Apple. Oh, is he? And for those of you who don't know, me and Nat used to work at Apple. So I guess he you did. can say he is our former boss. Mm, 
Loosely. Loosely form a bus. <laughs> so sit back, enjoy. Here's EJ. Oh, it's so good to be here. We love, I love what you all have done with this place. I love everything this, this place is about. And um, it's, just, it's just wonderful to be here. And thank you all for giving up your lions and your brunches this morning to be here. Particularly those of you that were at the brewery, like you were at the brewery last night and you're here already. That's, that's pretty awesome. Um, I, I think what I'm going to talk about and, and mostly reflect on is the idea that we need, and I was just sort of talking about that, we need a, uh, an attitude to leadership that is based on a really active, selfless, relentless love. Not sort of a feeling kind of love, but a, like love as an action. So I'm not big on titles, but if we were to title these reflections, I would say it's about uh, le leading with love in turbulent times. So I'm going to share some stories, um, some reflections. Um, be pre-warned, depending on how time goes, and I do have a clock there. I'm going to throw it to you at some point so that in twos and threes, you can have a chat amongst yourself. Um, and, and that way, we can all participate in, in, in some reflections around these issues. I'm going to start, and people controlling the images, you can put up uh, the, fir the first image, and probably the, the main image I'm going to use today. I'm going to start with this picture, which was taken on a Saturday morning, in a, just outside the church, but almost 61 years ago. And you can probably work out, it's my parents' wedding day. So it's 24th of December, 1960. Um, and there's, there's a ton happening in that picture. Of course, there is just the, um, the East, the, the, the Western world meets the New World kind of thing happening with my parents in the modern Western garb and the families either side of them in normal Nigerian garb. So you've got, kind of got the clash of cultures happening. But anybody who really knows what is going on at that time in, we're from Eastern Nigeria, we're Igbos, in Igbo culture, will kind of realize that there is a lot of loaded stuff going on in that picture. So both sides look fairly balanced, right? There's a man and two women, but they're com two completely different stories. My mom was from a, by those standards, a relatively affluent family. How can you tell? Her dad's got glasses on. All of them have footwear on. He's got two wives, and that was still kind of common then. But one of them has tucked a book underneath which says, I can read. And the, uh, my grandmother, my mom's mom, standing next to her, has got a handbag which says, I've got valuables. None of that on the other side. And the other side is also not, and this is not about the picture, but the other side is also not a mirror image because that isn't my grandfather. That's m one of my dad's uncles. And the woman next to, next to my grandmother, the, the giant woman who I'm going to talk about in a second, is not another wife of my grandfather is just another relative who shows up. And I say all that to say my grandmother was really my dad's only parent. And if we rewind 18 years before that, when my dad is nine, this, my grandmother, a young woman, loses her husband. So she is a, uh, a young woman, probably at this point in her 20s, with uh, an only son. It's 1942. Uh, in a British colony, the world is at war, and she's got some calculations to make here. Do I go down, send my son down the traditional route that every man in our village at that time would have gone through, which is you get the very basic bit of education by the time you're nine or ten, and then you go learn a trade, you go apprentice somewhere, maybe in a farm, or you just work the family land. And particularly if you don't have a husband anymore in a society where a lot of your value is about your husband, then really you want to kind of fast track your only child to adulthood. But something sparks this woman's imagination at a time of turbulence and change. It's this lady, who, this woman who doesn't have any Western education, so her read of what's happening broader is totally based on wisdom, 
as she sees young men from the village and surrounding village, villages being shipped out to fight the British war somewhere, and many of them were shipped to Burma and places like that. And those became almost the new elites. Some of them returned, speaking what those people thought as fluent English, and she kind of realizes that, hang on, the world is not what it used to be. So I'm gonna make a bet. I'm gonna make a bet that is different from what is expected of my son. And actually, I'm gonna bet on Western education. And so, she decides that if there's another level, educationally, that this young man can go, he's gonna go. And so after his primary school, where, where his peers go off to the farm, she sends him off to secondary school. In order to do that, she's gotta walk, walk five miles a day to sell tins of palm, um, palm oil in order to fund this. And she'll walk along, he will walk alongside her to the market. She'll sell the palm oil. She'll stuff some money in his pocket and chuck him on a train to, and I can't think, to I don't know what. I can't think she could have pictured it because she didn't know what that world was about. And so he finishes secondary school and, and, and she goes to him, is there another level? He goes, well, I, I can get a job. And he goes, she goes, is there another level? Yeah, there's this thing called university. So off he goes to university and she sells a bit of land and she does what she has to do until you arrive here. And this woman has raised a graduate who is now punching above his weight. He's got himself a fine bride from a rich family. <laughs> And, and the dynamic has changed. And so this notion of in turbulent times, love can spark our moral imagination to see things really differently from what seems obvious around us, to make the pivots from the way things are, is a way for us to always view times of turbulence as tough as they might feel. These are moments of incredible opportunity. And of course, the 60s, um, this point, were pretty turbulent times. So as I said, three, two months before this, just, just, just over two months before this, Nigeria had got its independence. So the British Empire now is really crumbling. The, the, the liberation movement is at pace in Africa. Ghana had had its independence three years before, right across the continent, either by force or by debate. Countries are um, g grabbing their independence. Britain is no longer the force in the world, but, in, but two new forces, the Soviets and the Americans, are beginning their, their conflict. Two years after this, of course, you have the great Cuban Missile Crisis that had the possibility of nuking the whole planet. In the rest of that decade, the 60s, amazing things are happening. We see the assassination of two kings and ex, two Kennedys and ex and a king. Um, we see the Vietnam War lead to all kinds of uh, protests right around the world. The civil rights movement, as we've talked about in America, kicks off. Um, but also, this is the decade where we put a man on the moon. This is a decade that was the founding of antiviral drugs, which we've needed. Um, this is also the decade that gave us Stevie Wonder. So this is an awesome decade at the same time, despite the, the turbulence. And, um, and so, as we look at time and as we look at our the environment we're in now, the environment you are all leading in, that is, I think you would agree with me, turbulent, as turbulent at least as the 60s. It's just worth us thinking, how do we identify that time, how to understand what's going on, and pivot with love? And I think as we think about, you know, 2021, it's worth us thinking beyond the fact that there's been a pandemic, that we're really pushing for a, a racial awakening, um, that climate change is a big issue, that um, our politics are more polarized than ever before. It's actually worth contextualizing that in a broader narrative. So we've talked about the 60s. How about the 70s? The 70s, we had the oil wars. We had really the, I'm gonna call it the invention of terrorism. We had in this country on the streets trash because our governments, we, we, the, the notion of being broke as a government becomes a real thing. As we move into the 80s, the Cold War is now at its, pretty much its climax. But also we have the, 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 the gradual beginning of the end of the industrial era that puts, that pits, if you like, workers against governments. We were, as we were driving in today, we were talking about the coal miners versus Margaret Thatcher. That notion, appeared right around the world. And so you begin to get this redefinition of our relationship with governments. 
we move into the 90s, and 90s is globalization really takes off, which benefits many, but also leaves many behind. The, the benefits are not evenly distributed, and it begins to redefine the kind of work we do and where we do it. And so what we have to lead becomes different. How we have to lead becomes different. And if that's not enough, we move into the 2000s, and it's like things really take off. The twin tower bombings, the Iraq war, create a new sort of global us versus them, but also, as we discover more, really leads to a catastrophic collapse in the relationship between citizens and governments. We no longer trust our governments. Later on in that decade, we have the credit crunch, right? We have the credit crisis. Um, and the impacts, the ultimate impacts of that are felt more on pe by people on the fringe who had nothing to do with causing it. So as we move into the 2010s, now with a, with a new agency of social media where I can not only express myself, I can find like-minded people, those fringes can not just organize, but can wormhole in their own eco chambers and really begin to really set up that. It's, it's, not, it's not just us versus them, it's me and the few people like me against the world. And we begin to see that as the decade gets into the middle of it, this explosion of populism, right? Of everybody being able to express their opinion and people, uh, poets, priests, and politicians being able to speak, trying to speak to our individual grievances and, and build narratives around that. So we get to the point we are as, as the pandemic starts where you have this, you have this incredible, let's call it hyper-individualism and these micro-tribes all constantly at war. That's the situation you have to then lead in. And so you step into, this, into positions of leadership, as you all are, and that's what you have to contend with. And you're asking yourself, how do I give everybody agency, because now everybody's got agency, without creating conflict in the organization? How do I stand for what's right, because there is right and wrong. How do I stand for what's right without shaming those who disagree with me? And we still got to do the work. We still have to produce stuff and get them out. So how do we do all of that without creating an unhealthy working environment? And so, like we all should do, we go to our elders. It's just like when the pandemic came out, happened, all of us as leaders, we went to our seniors and said, how did you guys deal with the pandemic in the 60s, there wasn't one. 70s, there wasn't one. 80s, so you haven't dealt with it. So you, now, we don't have any models to go to. We think about how leadership happened in the past. Well, if you go to the agrarian, if you go back to agrarian times, leadership was fundamentally a, a function of labor, of force. If you could move faster, dig deeper, you won. And then the industrial age comes and machines kind of disrupt that. And leadership becomes about management. If you can manage the resources and the timelines and the budgets and the people, you won. And two tools have been given to us, bequeathed to us to do this in particular. The first is the notion of culture fit. If you're gonna drive, if you're gonna run a really great organization, bring like-minded people together, and then you can eliminate all the variables and just push them. And the second tool is the notion of objectives. Hire those people, be super clear what you expect from them, and let them drive towards those objectives. Well, how does that work now? Culture fit? That sounds like exclusion in a world that's demanding inclusion. And in fact, it isn't a really great way of bringing people together because they have a point of view. Hang on, is it? Whose culture are you wanting me to fit into? How do you do that? And how about objectives? You're gonna tell me what to do? I don't know if you guys, who none of the people I'm leading come to me and say, EJ, what would you like me to do? Every single one of them tells me what they wanna do. And so this notion of leading by objectives and culture, culture fit, just doesn't work for us anymore. So what do we do? How do we think about that? in a time where everybody has their own opinion about how the organization should fit and how the, what the organization should do and how it should fit together to do it.
And actually, and let's be going back to sort of my grandmother's story, at a time where that actually does mean that the surface area for new ideas and new ways of doing things has never been bigger. That's good news. Because we have all these people now who are not longer just wanting to do what we ask them to do, but they want to have their idea. That's a great thing. But how do we harness that in a way that means at the end of the week, we are not exhausted and snappy to the people we love because work has been so tough this week? How do we do that? Well, I think that, and many of you in this room would be familiar with this story. I, 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 you know, we've done, we've, we've talked about the 40s, the 60s, 70s. Uh, I, there's, a, there's a great story um, that from the first century that I think shows us, and here's the clue, a more excellent way of leading. And if you think about first century Corinth, this city midway between Athens and Sparta, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a commercial city, but it's a place of ideas, of philosophy. It's a place where commerce and religion and business and government really intersect. It's a place where every thought leader builds their own followers. And it's into that heady mix, not unlike our time, of that heady, turbulent mix of opinions and factions and different icons to follow that a guy called Paul, St. Paul, decides to launch his startup. And he spends 18 months curating this startup. It's a church, but it could have been a digital agency, it could have been whatever, and he spends 18 months leading the thing. And because he's a startup guy, 18 months, thing is running, he goes to do another startup. But he's tracking progress on Slack. And he realizes, as he, the, the more he's following, he's like, oh my God, we have dysfunctional relationships Everybody is in it for themselves. And actually, in some cases, we have incredible uh, conflict within our team. This guy knows that this organization cannot continue to function, and so he has an intervention. And like any of us would do, he hosts this massive Zoom call. <laughs> but actually, it's, but we've got the transcripts, and he speaks, and the transcript runs to about 10,000 words to what he says. And what's really interesting to me about it, for the first three quarters of this, let's call it a letter, because we, we can't experience it as a Zoom call, for three quarters of this, he says some really smart stuff that make a ton of sense. And if I was to paraphrase and summarize, he says, stick with the vision. Don't, don't be looking for other things. Stick with the vision. Work as a team. Don't be setting up faction. Work as a team. You've got a vision. Work as a team. And then as individuals, please focus on honing your gifts. Be really clear what you're good at and lean into being good at that for the good of the team and for the vision. And, that, and, and it, but, it, but it is as if kind of he does that and kind of takes a breath and says, well, that's the instruction but now I'm gonna show you a more excellent way because all that stuff is really tough to follow. I know you are all trying to do so much, so I'm gonna show you a more excellent way. And you all know it, and it's, it's, it was probably recited at my parents' wedding, and today is a Saturday morning in buildings like this around the world, it will be recited. It starts with a flourish. If I could speak with the tongues of men and of angels but have no love, uh, I'm useless. If, if I'm so skilled and my PowerPoint skills are awesome and I use it to tell incredible stories and you know what, when, when it's 6 p.m. and everybody else wants to go home, I'm the guy who says, you're head home, I'll do it. I, I lay my body to be burned for the team. If I do all of that but have no love, it's a waste of time. I'm not achieving much. Now, most of the times when we hear that, of course, we're imagining two people across from each other looking into each other's eyes with longing and love, and he wasn't talking about that. It's, it's useful for that. Please, please, um, Al, please feel free to use that in your next wedding. It's not, it's not a problem, but he was, he was speaking to a dysfunctional group who lived in turbulent times, and we have those all around us. And I think what's really interesting for me is, as great as those early flourished verses are, I have come to find that there is a little section in there that gives me a wonderful framework uh, for leadership. 
and just five statements which I hope I can remember. The first is, he says, and you can almost, you can do this, I'm not going to do it, but you can substitute the word love for leadership if you're a leader. The first thing he talks about is uh, love is not self-serving. Leadership is not self-serving. Leadership, if you go into leadership with a viewpoint of my platform, my goal, me, I'm sorry, but you will have a lot of pain. Because leadership will let you down if you make it about yourself. And I think that it's so much more important to think about leadership, obviously, as creating the conditions for others to thrive, not creating the conditions for me to be elevated. So that's the, uh, that's the first piece of it. It isn't selfish. Um, and by the way, that's the second one. The, the one before that, which I think is really worth setting the context of it, it is love doesn't dishonor others. And I think that's supremely important for our time because shame has become one of the primary tools of influence in the times we live in. All that stuff we've talked about in the 2010s of everybody being able to express themselves and express their grievance and, and fight the other, all the us versus thems that have fragmented and multiplied is leading leaders themselves, certainly political leaders, but even business leaders, and creative leaders, to think that shame, to, to set ourselves against an other that is wrong so that we are right is the way to go. But it's futile. Because shame is neither a, 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 a great tool to build a great team, nor is it actually a useful management tool or competitive tool to set yourself up against the other. So love doesn't dishonor others or the other. So therefore, leadership can't dishonor others or the other. Love is not selfish. selfish therefore, leadership cannot be selfish. Three more. Love is love is slow to anger and doesn't hold account of evil, of grief, of, of, uh, for, of uh, offense. So love is slow to anger and doesn't hold account of offense. And one of the things I would say is, as a leader, and this is something that, and I'll, I'll talk about her in a second again, but uh, Brene Brown has this phrase that just remember the people who are messing up are doing their best. Now, the best might be really horrible, but they're doing their best. And, and sometimes, the loving thing to do is to say to them, this job's not right for you. And that can be an act of love. But please find a way to not make that an act of anger, because it's not healthy. It doesn't create healthy organizations. So leadership doesn't act on anger. It acts on love. Fourth one, leadership doesn't rejoice in evil, it rejoices in the truth. One of the dangers with everything I've been saying is that it can sound like we're saying, never have any judgment, never have any opinion. Actually, leadership really is clear about what is right and what is wrong. The American theologian, philosopher, Reinhold Niebuhr has this great quote, and I've kind of got it in my notebook because I refer to it every day. Uh, love is the motive, it's the reason, love is the motive, but justice is the instrument. Love that doesn't result in kind of decision making about what's right, about what's fair, about what's the, 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 the good thing to do, is kind of like useless. And so it's really important that without um, without succumbing to shaming and glory seeking, that leaders stand for what is right and what is true. And then the final thing to say, uh, the final one I love is uh, love, and these are a series of always is, love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. It is a gift to lead people. I know it feels like a burden a lot, but it is a gift. 
And it is to lead people, not to lead for ourselves. We've touched on that before. Leadership, like love, has to lean into the places of need. That's why, of course, it's taxing. Leadership isn't about actually running around and celebrating all the good stuff. Leave that to the troops. Leadership is to figure out what's not working. Where is their pain? Where is their dysfunction? Where is somebody on the edge? Where is somebody not been brought into it? Those are the things almost your agenda has to be to make things better. Al talked about recoding the world. You know, we've got to be leaning into those places of pain. So I know that sounds difficult, but that has to be the goal of leadership. Not to just look for the things that are right. If we're championing the things that are right, it is actually with the fundamental purpose of protecting and trusting and hoping and persevering as we work through those, those really tough times. I'd summarize that a bit by saying, therefore, I think of leadership as, uh, I've said this already, creating the conditions for others to thrive. But I want to stick on the word creating as a contrast to other forms of leadership, which we've touched on. The agrarian age, it's about labor. The industrial age, which we're still struggling to extricate ourselves from, was about management. I think the fundamental tool of, of leadership in today's world is creativity. Because it really forces you to tap into, like my grandmother, your moral imagination to think about something that can be better, something that can be different. Not being stuck in the current reality. Management is about the current reality, managing the resources, the teams, the people. Still have to have that as a skill, by the way. But the fundamental skill is about creating, about tapping into your moral imagination. I was talking to Al a few weeks ago and asking a bit about this audience, and one of the things I hope he's okay with me saying this is like, people are going to be tired because this has been a tough season the last two or so years, tough season. And I'm, I'm, I'm aware of that demanding that we have more love in the way we think about leadership can be a burden. So I want to leave you with three things. Um, just to reflect on, and we won't do, I was going to have you do that reflection now, but I'm, I'm not quite sure what's happening with the time, so I might just move on from that. But the three things I'd, I'd like to offer you as, as tools that make leadership doable, this form of leadership doable, and they all tap into love. The first is, consider being more obsessed with your inputs than your outputs. I'll explain. We've come, to a, we, we, we've come to a time where everybody wants to be in the upper right quadrant, and we, are, we have access to data, and we are looking for growth. And those things are all great. I'm not against, we've talked about objectives earlier, I'm not against measuring what you're achieving, the outputs. But face it, the outputs and the outcomes you produce, you're just one of many variables that are going to determine them. The thing you've got complete control about is your input, how you show up. What am I bringing to it, to, that, um, to my team, and what am I bringing to the people that I lead? And my encouragement to you, and this is something I do and I've found really useful, start the day by looking at the people you're going to be with and ask yourself, not what am I trying to get out of that, but what am I putting in? What are my inputs into that? And at the end of the day, when you evaluate yourself, evaluate yourself on how you showed up. And yes, please evaluate yourself and look to get better. Did you snap too quickly? Were you patient enough? Did you think, did you try and empathize with where they were coming from? Those inputs have the power to transform your leadership. And every study shows that actually when you lead with inputs, you're actually going to produce better outputs anyway. So the first thing, lead with inputs and don't beat yourself up. Be kind to yourself about results and about outcomes. The second thing is have your boundaries. Have your boundaries. For me, don't try and get any time with me after 7 p.m. because I have too much time with my wife and kids, too much fun with my wife and kids to give that up. And let me tell you another one. Don't even try to get me on a Saturday. They're here, that's the only reason you can get me here because I'm not being in a different place from them, right? So know your boundaries, hang on to them. If having a, like Al said, we're not great walkers, but that's important. We kind of like once a month get with somebody you love and respect and go for a walk, and that's a boundary, and nobody's going to, don't let anybody take that. Have your boundaries. One of the problems we have with boundaries as leaders is that we think saying no comes across as us not being generous. 
talked about Brennan Brown earlier. Brennan Brown's done some real rigorous research that shows that the most generous people tend to be the most boundaried people. Because when they say yes, they're saying it from a point of, yeah, absolutely, I want to do it. Not like, okay, I've got to do it. So have your boundaries, and then when you're present, be present, knowing fully well that your boundaries are, are really clearly set. And then the final thing I would do, and people who know me will go, here he goes again, be essentialist. Focus on the fewest possible things that have the largest possible impact. There's a great book on this, written by a guy called Greg McEwen, called Essentialism. Uh, people must think I'm a salesman for this, because whatever I go, I, I don't even know the guy. Read Essentialism. Uh, Johnny Ive, who is the legendary designer from Apple, talks about prioritization, not as saying no to things that are unimportant, that's just common sense. Prioritization is saying no to things that every bit of your being wants to do, but you know that if you do it, it will prevent you from doing something even more important. So edit, edit, cut, cut, focus on the fewest possible things. And that makes work doable. If we're focused on our inputs that I can control and not being beating ourselves up on things we can't control, if we have clear boundaries, and if we focus on the things that matter, work becomes doable. And here's what's interesting about that. That's great creative practice, even if you're not a leader, right? Um, focus, have a clear set of boundaries, be clear what you're putting into that, and really focus on what matters. Every design brief should have, every great design brief should be clear about the inputs, the boundaries, and what really matters. And that really unleashes your creativity. So I'd, I'd like to encourage you to do that reflection in your own time. How am I showing up? What are my inputs? How do I get much more rigorous about my boundaries? And then also, how do I become essentialist and focus on the things that matter? I want to wrap up, and if we can go back to the screen, <clears throat> and just some final thoughts on, um, on my grandmother. Um, that's her son, my dad, and that is those two worlds. And so in the mid-60s, in this period of, as we've said, turbulence, but also incredible optimism by his generation of Africans who finally have countries, he goes off to America for a 12-month um, uh, a program, a 12-month uh, visiting professorship in, in eastern Pennsylvania. Next slide. But while he's gone, the Nigerian civil war breaks out. He's left behind his wife and my two other siblings, my mom and his two other siblings in Nigeria, and, and they're separated by the turmoil and the turbulence of the 60s, in this case, the civil war in Nigeria. And we were from, we are from the bit of Nigeria that was called Biafra that tried to succeed. And, 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 and six million people died. Um, and he's got, so this, this young sort of university teacher has his young family out there. And he manages to um, pay people smugglers to take them out. Next slide. And so this is my mom and my other siblings arriving. And I don't think we have too many young kids here, so I can say this. Nine months to the day my mom arrived, I was born. Next slide. And, um, and despite how I currently show up, I used to have a really good dress sense. Um, so this is, this is, this is um, a small university town in Strasbourg, Pennsylvania. But these were not people who wanted to be away from home. These were optimists about the place they were from. And so once it was safe for uh, us, my parents moved us back to Nigeria. And they didn't move us back, next picture, to... Um, to Lagos that you would have heard of, or Patakot, and Abuja didn't even exist, and didn't move us back to a big city, moved us back to their ancestral home. And I went to the village primary school, the same primary school my dad would have gone 35 years earlier. And that's me to the side of the teacher. I used to show, when I used to show people this picture, I'd ask them to guess which one was me, and they'd point out the girls, so I don't do that anymore. Um, so that's me just on the side of the teacher. And I, I would, in closing, a, a few things that growing up at that place and that time in my life did for me. It made me realize that creativity isn't something that some people have. It's something that all of us have. The closest word I've found to creativity 
in the Igbo language is akonuche, and it's two words. It's, it's thought and make. It's this ability that we can both think and do. What's interesting about that is it goes with the do word before the thought word. It's a, it's a process that does that. But you can't use it as an adjective. You can't say live is akonuche, because everybody's had akonuche. You can say Liv uses her akonuche better than EJ, but they both have it. It's innate in who we are. And so if we, if we go forward, that sort of, that sense of creativity is an expression of who we are leads to more bad fashion sense. That's me as a teenager in Nigeria. But it also leads to a sense of knowing who you are. Your creativity is an expression of who you are. And I have to say, I'm holding on tight to that all the days of my life. Next slide. So as a, as a student at Columbia University, I am the Nigerian guy, right? Not as a way to define myself as, a, as an other, but as a way next to my friend Ron, who's from the deep south in America, my friend Sanjeev, whose family emigrated from Emnabad, my friend Tim, whose family are half Mexican, half Puerto Rican, and together we are richer because we can all bring our stories together. One of the really sad things about the pandemic is that it prevented me to go for Sanjeev's 50th birthday two weeks ago in New York, but we've stayed close because, not because we've erased who we are, but because we've really lent into who we are. And on the next slide, and, and I, I want to end with this. This is a, an in, next to me is an intense Scotman called Brian Boylan, who for almost 30 years was the chairman of Wolf Olins. He was the first employee. Wolf Olins was started by Michael Wolf and Wally Olins, and Brian Boylan was the first employee, and he was a chairman. And when he appointed me the CEO of Wolf Olins, he said to me, and I'm not going to do a Scottish accent, if you ever stop being Nigerian, I'm firing you. And I love that because I think that is leadership. And I want to end on, on with, with two things. Next slide is, is back to my grandmother. This is the theme of my talk. We live in turbulent, turbulent times. Please treat that as the ultimate creative brief to spark your moral imagination, to think of better ways. And, and like I said, she didn't really know what that meant, but she understood her inputs. If I can get my son to do things that are different, to do things that are positive, we might be okay. And I think that would be my message to you. We might be okay. I, um, I met somebody this weekend, this, this week for the first time, I had lunch with a guy called David Johnson. And, I, and he lives in Hackney. He said, oh, you live in Hackney? I'm actually speaking in Hackney. You want to come? He said, oh, I can't make it. Um, it doesn't come from a, a church tradition. But this morning, he sent me this note, and I really do want to end on this, because I just thought, <gasps> holy spirit. Um, he said, just wanted to wish you the best of luck today. I can't make it, but I'm so, because you went to look at your website, I, I'm so inspired by what all involved with Renaissance are doing. It is powerful. I've been reflecting since our lunch that regardless of the many problems we face, the solution is spiritual. In our lifetime, we will witness a recognition that will represent a coming home to a coherent relationship with our ecology, with each other, with ourselves. Every single moment of life, I'm getting emotional, every single moment of life is an energetic opportunity to raise the vibration and improve the whole. Act in light, move with harmony, harness love. And he ends with a quote by a lady, an American dancer called Diane Powell, who said, God's gift to us is life, and what we become is our gift to God. I just think that's an amazing way to end. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for that amazing talk. Just so you know, next week is actually our last week of our Renaissance summer series. Wow, so time flies, hey. It does, it really does. Time flies when you're having fun. When you're fun. having fun, that's true. So it's been a great service. How about I pray, and then we're gonna go into one more song of worship. Sound good? Sounds great. Okay, thank you God for everything you've done in and through the service. May you bless everyone watching, and may they have the best weeks. Amen. Amen. So enjoy worship. See you next week. See ya.
wide open in expectation we need your love we need your touch King of heaven move move in power we need we need your love we need your touch touch. with hearts wide open expectation we need your love. We need your touch. King of heaven, move in power. We need your We need your touch. Your hearts wide open. It's the expectation. Over us, over us. Won't you, King of Heaven, move in power? We need your love. We need your touch. With hearts wide open.
on, let's lift our hands. Come on, let's sing out to our God. Come on, raise your voice. Come on, raise your song, raise your sound. Come on, louder, louder. We need you more than ever. Oh, raise your voice, raise your sound. We need you more than ever. So come and fall, come and fall. Hey, love. So come and fall, come and fall. In the valleys you are with me. God, you always go before me. Oh. Doesn't matter when I can't see. You will lead me in the mystery, Lord. In the valleys you are with me. God, you always go before me. Doesn't matter what I can't see. You will lead me in the mystery. In the valleys, in the valleys you are with me. Always go before me. And you always go before me. Doesn't matter when I can't see. What I can't see. You will meet me in the mystery. Yeah. In the valley, you are with me. God, you always go before me. Doesn't matter when I can't see you. You will leave me in the mystery. 